morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, brother. So, scripture reading will be coming from Acts chapter 1 this morning. Jesus taken up into heaven. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. And when suddenly two men dressed in white stood before them, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? That same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, we back the same way you've seen him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks, brother. Now I'm on. Cool. Um, Acts is a is a book that's personally meaningful for me. So um, when I first started fo following Jesus pretty seriously, this is like right after high school, early early college time. I went to Walmart and I bought myself a hardcover red life application study Bible. It's the one that I saw my mom reading all the time, and it was cheap. It was like twenty five dollars, and I started reading in the Gospel of John, and so. Those stories were compelling, they're captivating, but if I'm honest, there was some familiarity because I had grown up in church. But when you flip over, the very next book is the book of Acts. So I said, let me just continue to read, and that book floored me, just absolutely blew me away at these disciples who were willing to take on suffering and persecution and, and jail time for the sake of the gospel. And I took a look at myself and I said, my faith does not compare to these men. What do I need to possess faith like that? And so Acts has always been a book that's been meaningful to me. So I'm super excited to start going through it. And I pray that you guys have the same experience with it. Our plan is to uh, march through the first section of Acts. So chapters one through eight, we'll probably take a pause at the end of the summer, but today we're going to look at the first 11 verses of Acts 1, which were just read. Uh, these are Jesus's final days post-resurrection. So he's died on the cross. He's risen on the third day. He spent about 40 days with the disciples, uh, showing them proofs that he really is alive, that his resurrection is not spiritual, but bodily and physical. And so then he's getting ready to leave and leave them with instructions. And he's going to commission the disciples with what's next, the power and the responsibility to continue Jesus' rule in the earth. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's pray and we'll dive in together. Father, we love you. We thank you that uh, you have extended your rule, your power, your presence to us, the gathered people of God who have been redeemed by God. I pray that that power fills our hearts even this morning so that we might leave this place to go out and proclaim the excellencies of your mercy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When it comes to leadership, uh, one of the most important yet overlooked responsibilities of the leader is the process of succession. It's, it's the question of who's going to carry this legacy, this leadership on into the future. When I'm gone, 
Who's next? When this leadership structure ceases to exist, who's going to take up the mantle and continue this organization? History is a glaring warning of what happens when we do this poorly, right? Look no further than the MCU, Marvel. First phase of movies up through Endgame, great movies, right? What's been going on since then? She-Hulk, The Eternals, like nobody likes that stuff. <laughs> Poor succession. Or how about Alexander the Great? Seemed like he was about to conquer the world, right? And then he died early from probably typhoid fever at age 32. Hadn't set up a clear plan of succession, had no heir. And so his generals fought over land and divided it up to where the empire eventually crumbled. Without a clear plan of succession, these legacies and influences fell apart. But there are also good examples, right? Somehow the Packers are able to find a quality quarterback all the time. Literally never had a bad one. I don't know how they do that. Lakers seemingly always have some kind of a basketball star to lead the team. But the best example of succession may come from the Old Testament. So if you grew up in the church, you probably remember the prophet Elijah or if you have Jewish friends, you'll know that around Passover, they leave a seat empty for the return of Elijah. This is one of their beliefs. Elijah was a great prophet in Israel. And you'll probably know that he had a successor, Elisha. So how did that process take place? While speaking with Elisha, a whirlwind, this is in 2 Kings chapter 2, a whirlwind came and took Elijah up to heaven. Very similar to Jesus' ascension that we just read about. After this, or I'm sorry, this comes after Elijah had just laid hands on Elisha, much like we did to the deacons a few moments ago in service. So he extended this blessing, this ordination of ministry from Elijah to Elisha. Then Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind up into heaven. And the sons of the prophets who watched said this in 2 Kings 2.15, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. Does that not sound familiar? Jesus, taken up into heaven, sends his spirit to us. That same pattern of succession, of, of leadership, of the one leader departing to a different task and leaving the responsibility with someone else, that's us. We possess the spirit of God now and continue Jesus' legacy and leadership on throughout the world. The spirit of Jesus rests on us, his disciples, and so throughout Acts, we will see God's plan of succession, which is the church. Because Jesus continues to rule the world primarily through his church, we have the responsibility to carry that legacy faithfully. I'm going to talk about this in three ways. First, we're going to talk about where did Jesus go? So I said he re resurrected bodily. Where is he now? What is he doing is our second point. And then the last point is how will he get this done? Let's talk about where did Jesus go? Before answering that, I want to note a couple of things to make sure we're all on the same page and understanding Acts very well. So Acts is written by a man named Luke. Luke is a contemporary of Paul. They're friends. They're boys. They hang out together. They read the Bible together. Luke is the same author that wrote the gospel according to Luke. So we went through that book together as well as a church a couple of years back. Both Acts and Luke are written to a man by the name of Theophilus. So you'll see right at the beginning of the passage, he names this, oh, excellent Theophilus that he's writing the book to. Most believe that this is a Roman official of some sort. And so what it seems to be Luke's goal is, is that he wants to demonstrate the goodness and truthfulness of Jesus to a Roman official. Or let me state that in another way. Luke wants to demonstrate the goodness and truthfulness of Jesus Christ to someone who does not have a religious background. He's presenting to Theophilus and to those who would read it the case that Jesus Christ is Lord and his kingdom has come to bear on this earth through the church. Right away in verse 1, we read, In the first book, O Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach an interesting wording there that Jesus's death, burial and resurrection is just the beginning of what he came to do and teach. Well, Acts then is the continuation of it. This is so important for us to grasp. Jesus's ascension into heaven is the, the continuation of his ministry, not the end of it. Jesus is seated on a throne and he's reigning even now. 
couple of important things to remember. Number one, this is the completion of Jesus' earthly ministry. So, so Jesus ascending into heaven, what we read there in verse 9, that as the disciples are there, he gets taken up into heaven right before their sight, just like Elijah was before Elisha. This signifies the completion of his earthly ministry. On the cross, you may remember him declaring, it is finished. His death was finished by finishing the payment of our sins, but his ministry is not finished. That continues on through the church. Maybe you can liken it to something like paying college tuition for your kids. Jesus made the payment on the cross, so there's no debt. You're no longer guilty before God. You don't owe Sally Mae anything. Do people still borrow from Sally Mae? I don't know if that's a thing. She's got a lot of cash. Um, but there still remains the application to you in real time. So while the bill is paid, you still have to go to college, learn, and then apply what you learn to the rest of your life. There's more to be done. So you, as members of the church, here's how, the, how that works. You're called by God in real time and space. You believe in Jesus Christ. The calling of God takes place in your heart. And then you are commissioned to go out and to spread the gospel in Jesus' name. That's why Luke can say that Jesus' death and resurrection is just the beginning. Because at that point, the church had not yet been commissioned to go out and to spread the good news to the world. That's where you and I come in. You and I, those of you who call Jesus your Lord and Savior, have been called out of darkness into light. We've been commissioned to work like evangelists to gather together and worship each and every, each and every Sunday, to, to go out into the world and display the goodness of Jesus Christ in the message of the gospel by sharing it, telling it with people, and de demonstrating it with our actions. Secondly, Jesus' ascension into heaven also means that his work is accepted by God. I don't want us to take that point for granted. If you remember, there's a great tragedy in the Garden of Eden. I reference this all the time. Adam and Eve have sinned against God. And if you remember at the end of the story, they're kicked out of the presence of God and there's angels with flaming swords guarding the entrance back into the garden. In other words, symbolizing you cannot get back into the presence of God because of the sin that's present in your heart. Sin put a permanent gap between humanity and who we need most, which is God. But if Jesus went up into heaven, that means that he re-entered into the presence of God. Follow me. We were separated from God, not allowed to be in his presence, yet Jesus becomes a human being, lives the life that we could not, dies the death that you and I should have died, resurrects to demonstrate that death has no power over him, and then he gets back into the presence of God where nobody could go. Again, what does that tell us? That tells us that Jesus' work was accepted. That God saw his life, his death, his resurrection as acceptable, as pleasing, as, as a reasonable sacrifice and fancy word, a propitiation for our guilt and for our sins. You ever swipe your debit card and just pray that it goes through? You know what I'm talking about? Or insert the chip or tap it and you're just like, you're looking at the cashier. You don't want them to make eye contact with you because you don't know if the funds are there. You're just kind of hoping they are. It's that odd week where, you know, the payday comes on Monday, right? So this is Saturday. You're just trying to have a good time. You don't get paid till Monday. But then you hear that receipt printing, and you're like, praise the Lord. My payment has been accepted. There's a promise for you embedded in verse 9 that as Jesus goes up to heaven, it's been accepted, and that you, by trusting in him, have also been accepted. Here's how that works. That my faith unites me to Jesus. And so if he's accepted into heaven, so will I by putting my trust in Jesus Christ. You can trust that your faith unites you to Jesus and makes you acceptable in God's eyes. That's beautiful news. You spend so much of your life trying to be accepted, don't we? We want to be accepted by a group of friends, by a certain status of, of, of co-workers or managers. We want them to, to like us and think highly of us. We want to be accepted by our parents. We want them to be proud of us. Maybe you're looking for acceptance from your kids. You just want your kids to like you, think you're a cool mom or dad, and want to be able to open up and share with you as they age. So you spend every waking hour doing what you need to do to be accepted. 
don't think we realize how much time we spent mentally working out the details so that we would be accepted by other people. It's exhausting. I hope that this reality sets you free. You have already been accepted by Jesus Christ. That means that you can and probably will be rejected by other human beings as this life goes on. Other human beings that you really desire, their appreciation, their service, their love, their care, their affection towards you. You're, you're, you're dying for it. You desire it. You want it. And there will be some that even though you desire their love and acceptance, they'll choose to reject you. But there's one who's greater than they are, right? And he never will reject you. You are accepted by faith in Jesus Christ. Just as he entered into heaven, that is a guarantee for all who put their faith, faith in Jesus. So where did Jesus go? He went to heaven, completing the work of redemption for you and guaranteeing your acceptance before God in spite of your sin. But what's he doing up there in heaven? This is our second point. What is he doing? Look with me at verse 6. So when they had come together, these are the disciples, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're asking about national power. You remember that in the background. They, they're expecting this Messiah, this king, this, this great person to come and set Israel as a nation free from the burden of the Roman Empire. And so now that Jesus has resurrected, they're like, you want me to go get my sword now or later? You, you want to eat dinner first? Like, is it, is it time now to go and take over this kingdom? See, in their reading of the Old Testament, the disciples expected Israel to be a sovereign nation ruling over all the other nations. A lot of those kinds of promises were associated with the spirit. So you read through the Old Testament, you see the spirit dwells on this Messiah, this person, and then there's triumph that follows. But here's the problem. The disciples' vision was too small. They wanted a king of Israel. You and I don't live in Israel. I'm thankful that Jesus is not just the king of Israel. Rather, Jesus' ascension seats him as king over the world. His throne isn't in Jerusalem. It's in heaven. And because he's seated in heaven, all people, all places, all nations, all tribes, all tongues bow their, bow their knee to King Jesus, and he rules over us all. Gerhardus Voss is just... Listen to that name. Just sounds like a smart German guy. Here's what he says. By not establishing his earthly throne in the earthly Jerusalem, but exalting that throne far above it to a height for which earthly boundaries are no longer visible, Christ showed that he was anointed over a spiritual Israel. His royal city is the Jerusalem that is above the free the mother of us all. And that line, the mother of us all, comes from Galatians. It's a better covenant that we have with Jesus Christ. The ascension establishes Jesus Christ as the king over the world. The king over all ethnicities, genders, geographic boundaries. There is one king, the king Jesus Christ, and he sits on a throne above the earth. Don't miss that point. His ascension to the throne above the world means that he is the king of all people. Think of all the unrest at universities domestic over the Israel and Palestine situation. Universities literally shutting down because of fighting and protests and so on and so forth. Nations at war at the expense of a lot of innocent people. Wherever we stand in the argument, we know that there's a lot of innocent people losing their lives. And at the core are some who believe that one nation has a divine right over the other. I want to state it and state it clearly. But that's not a thing. God does not favor one nation over another. Jesus Christ is king over the world. There is one Lord over us all, a good Lord who invites us into a relationship with him by grace. Now, of course, the, the political outworking of that stuff, that matters, right? We need to make good decisions about how we proceed. But applying divine right to either side, you've already lost the intellectual battle because you are incorrect. Jesus Christ is Lord over all. What's interesting here is that this was always God's intent. This isn't some new thing that arrives out of nowhere. Jesus ruling over the world, it's not a, it's not a pivot because Israel couldn't get it together. Sometimes we read it that way. 
We read about the Israelites grumbling in the wilderness and worshiping idols. And then we kind of look with our nose up. We look at the Old Testament like, oh, never, far be it from me to act in such an ungodly way. And we believe that because Israel behaved in that way, God then turned his blessing elsewhere. That's only part of the reality. But actually, when you look at verse 8, let's read that again. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Did you know that in that moment, Jesus Christ is quoting the Old Testament? He is speaking about fulfillment of prophecies that happened long before that moment took place. Number one, when he says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, that comes from Isaiah 32. The context of Isaiah 32 is this promise of a righteous king, a king who's completely holy, who would rule over the people, and his rule would result in justice and peace for all. Jesus Christ is declaring in that moment, I am that king, and I'm ascending to my throne. Secondly, he says, you all will be my witnesses. This comes from Isaiah 43. It's a passage that promises that God will raise up witnesses who will proclaim God's power and goodness. And guess what? That's you and me. We are witnesses of the greatness of Jesus Christ, getting to proclaim that to the world. And lastly, Isaiah 49 tells us that this king would be a king over the nations. So when Jesus says that we're going we're gonna to carry this witnessing me- message to the ends of the earth, remember, that's not plan B. That was embedded in the promises even back in Isaiah 49. This king would reign over the entire world. And so in serving the king of the world, we need to be inclusive of the world. You'll see pretty quickly in Acts how resistant some of the disciples become to this idea of being inclusive. They believed that the Jewish customs and culture were were prerequisites for being included in the community. You'll see later on in Acts, they're going to argue about circumcision and and various foods that you can eat, basically saying, you've got to be really Jewish before God will even pay attention to you. And you're going to see that the disciples consistently battle against that idea. See, we can do this either intentionally or unintentionally. What I mean is we we can add customs to the gospel and present them as prerequisites for getting into the faith. And we need to constantly reassess our beliefs, our culture, our customs, and make sure we are not blocking people from the kingdom of God because we've presented a Jesus that is not biblical. I'll give you a simple kind of a lighthearted example, but I think it paints the picture well. When my wife and I first got married, uh, we were going to a couples group at another church. And obviously not this one, because this this one didn't exist. (laughs) Praise God, it exists now. Uh, We were the only couple in the group without kids. So we had just gotten married. It was a married couples group studying the Bible together. A very good group, let me just say that. But every other couple in the group had kids. So every Bible study, we'd be reading. You know, you get to Genesis 12, and the Lord called Abraham, be a blessing. And then someone would be like, you know, Zachary won't eat vegetables. I'm like, man, I I don't I'm not, let me reread the passage. I don't see that in the, in the text. And then the conversation would just diverge into that the entire, the entire time. Some of you feel me, you've, you've, you've been there before. Now, there's nothing wrong with a marriage group, with kids, talking about kids. Like, that's good. That's community. We should be able to understand how to parent well. What didn't happen in that group, though, however, was anyone going out of their way to ensure that there was comfort, instruction, inclusivity and community for the one couple that did not have kids. I use that as a lighthearted example because I think that happens often, right? We just have oversight. Get into our little groups. We talk about the things that are meaningful and natural to us, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. We need community and to support one another where we are. But we also need the eyes of Jesus who came down from heaven to condescend and bring other people into a relationship with the kingdom. That's what we're called to do, to have the eyes that say, okay, it's time to turn my needs off for a second and go and care about the needs of this other person over here so that they understand they are welcome and they are included. Jesus Christ is the king of the world. It's irrespective of ethnicity, stage of life, age, economic background. Jesus is the king of the world and all who are in it. 
The reality is that the Old Testament continuously promised this global king. So our gospel focus must also be global. If Jesus is seated on his throne as the king of the world, that means that he is blessing and saving all who call on his name, irrespective of where they're from. And so what I want to talk about in our last point is how Jesus does that. He's seated on his throne, accepted by God, ruling from that throne. But how does that take place in real time and space? Well, let's talk about that as our last point. As Jesus declares that the disciples would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria from Acts chapter 1-8, this this fourfold mission actually serves as the structure for the whole rest of the book. So you'll see in chapters 2 through 7, you'll see the Holy Spirit being poured out in Jerusalem. Then in chapters 8 through 12, it's Judea and Samaria. And then from 13 on, it's the rest of the world. So this is almost like the prologue that we're reading. But here's the point. Jesus extends his power and his presence through the church to the whole world. Jesus extends his power, the power that he has enthroned above the world, his presence above the world. He extends that through the church to the world. Let me say it another way. When people ask, where is God? Part of that answer is the church. This is why we emphasize being part of a community of a body. It's a great technological advancement that we can watch church online. That should be the exception and not the rule. We need to be amongst the body of believers. Being amongst the body of believers also doesn't just mean showing up on Sunday, hearing a message, and then getting back to doing other stuff. But it means being involved in community, hanging out, whether formally or informally, but really pressing into one another's lives to demonstrate the power and the presence of Jesus. Here's how this works. When you first trust in Jesus, I trust in God. I won't, I'm not going to sing. I won't do it. But when that happens, when you trust in God, he fills your heart with the Holy Spirit. If I'm being technically correct, the Holy Spirit arrives first, right? The Holy Spirit arrives, revives your dead heart to life, causes you to see the beauty of Jesus Christ, which then enables you to trust in him. The spirit has resurrected your dead heart back to life. And then he takes residence in your heart. There's a prayer of Paul in Ephesians chapter three, that the spirit would take residence in our heart, living there, rearranging the furniture, doing, you know, knocking down the popcorn off the ceilings. He's making it look nice inside of our hearts. Some of us are more of a project than others. The presence of Jesus then, after having professed faith in him, is forever with you. And one of the things that he grants you while being with you is power. At the end of Luke, remember these books are connected. Luke wrote the gospel of Luke. He wrote Acts as well. His closing words in the gospel of Luke are this. You are witnesses. And behold, I'm sending you the promise of my father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. The Holy Spirit residing in your heart is power from on high. How's how's Jesus ruling the world? Through the power that he's distributed to the church in the world. The power to represent Jesus' authority through his word and gospel. Only the church controls what the word says, right? You You can have politicians hold Bibles up and talk about it. You can have people outside of the church write what they think the Bible means. You can go to universities and study the Bible as literature, but only through the church will you get the proclaimed, thus saith the Lord, the command of God through the spirit to cause you to repent and obey. Only the church can do that. Through the church, we have power to speak life into that which was once dead. Everything else is encouragement. Through the church, you get actual power to resurrect that which was dead. And lastly, you get the power to do what God has called you to do. You can get motivational speaking literally anywhere. You can change your mind. You can change your eating hap- habits. You can, you can read powerful books that, that help you become a better person. But only through the word of God, through the church, can you interact with Jesus Christ himself and receive the power to do what God has called you to do. The church is essential. It's the continued rule of Jesus Christ in the world. And so here's where we land. Jesus' rule over the world is represented through you. Our sermon today is called, If I Ruled the World. It's Nas. He's riding around in his bends just wondering, 
with Lauren Hill. If I ruled the world. And then when you actually read the plan, it's like, man, it's not a, it's not a great plan, right? That's, we could do better than that, Nas. Nah, that's probably why he never got elected, just because, like, hey, we've seen your policies and not great, Nas. Nah, we, could, we could do better. The answer to that question, oddly enough, is you already do. If I rule the world, faith in Jesus Christ has connected you to a community, a body of believers that extends through, through the past all the way to, to Abraham and before and into the future of what we don't even know what comes. And so obviously I don't mean in the literal sense, like don't walk out of these, the, these walls and say, I'm in charge, go speeding down the road and get pulled over. Sir, I'm in charge. I rule the world. That's not, that's not what I mean. But you've been given the spirit and the power of Jesus Christ, which means nothing in this world can stop you. There's a greater kingdom that awaits. There's nothing here that can hold you back or separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so our mission as a church is to demonstrate the goodness of God here as it is in heaven. Jesus was and is heaven come to earth. And now that he reigns from heaven, you and me are the earthly representation of what heaven will be like. We're the commercial, we're the advertisement, we're the trailer. We are the way we treat one another as how people will understand what Jesus is like. And the way we treat the world says something about what Jesus believes about the world. And so we've got to be intentional about including the world in Christian community. Being intentional to reach out to those who are different than you. If Christ is enthroned above the world, that means that all who are in the world are welcome into his community and kingdom. We do this by trusting in the Spirit's power. Fervent prayer, confident ev evangelism. If my power comes from the Spirit, I do the Spirit no justice by ignoring him and continuing on in my own intellect and understanding. But rather, I receive more of the power and unleash that power the more I submit and allow the Spirit to do his work in my heart and in the world around me. This power means incomprehensible love. Jesus has given you the power to represent him, the power over your guilt and shame. But those things ultimately don't matter in the end because Christ has already paid on your behalf. And so we collectively together, with arms locked, with all of our mess, confessing our sins to one another, bearing one another's burdens, go out into the world representative of Jesus so that they might see just how good he is. That's Jesus' plan of succession, his power, his presence through you. Let's pray together. Jesus, we are humbled by the reality that you rule the world through us. Sometimes we question that plan, rightly looking in at our own hearts and seeing individuals who have departed from the will of God, those who have chosen to sin and, and commit idolatry. Yet, Jesus, your mercy is so great that you've made us pure by your blood. And so I pray from that, from that purity, the recognition of your presence, and the fulfillment of the power from the Holy Spirit, you would cause us to be accurate representations of you so that many people might know the Lord and know him intimately. This is our heart's desire, Jesus. Do this through us today. It's in your name we pray. Amen.